Good morning, everyone. So let's uh, start right away, Algorand 2.0. And uh, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers of this um, great uh, uh, workshop. And uh, they actually think that uh, the block space um, uh, needs a really more academic presence. You know what? I wholeheartedly agree. I'm an academic, and I'm uh, the founder of uh, Algorand. So let me tell you, before the version 2.0 kicks in, what Algorand is, is an alternative blockchain. So it's going to be quite different from the ones which we, are, we know and love right now. And uh, it's been developed from first principle, pretty much from scratch, because sometimes it's better to not to have, <laughs> to have any handcuffs and all at your ankles. And uh, third, which I'd like to explain, hopefully, in these 45 minutes, is going to be enable um, continuous progress. What does this mean? It will become clear later on. So let's cut the chase and let's start with, you know, um, <laughs> to acknowledge uh, the truth, right? So um, uh, blockchains have been uh, aspirational, so uh, way more than technological, okay? So uh, there is a lot of um, writings about the journalists, the politicians, sociologists, and all the decentralization wave, the decentralization wave. You know, blockchain, the way we write them in the paper, they don't exist. So, and um, here is the alleged trilemma that says, hey, wait a second, you have to choose. You want a blockchain? Well, either security, scalability, decentralization, choose which one to exclude. Really? Just to think about it, it's a blockchain by design. Uh, yes, we designed a blockchain for you. Which property do you want to sacrifice? Security, it will be done. Or, or you want to sacrifice uh, scalability. It's really like saying, you know, do you want to be shot on the left knee or on the right knee? So, well, that is not acceptable. And fortunately, it's not true. Okay. So, on blockchains, one thing we agree, right? Everybody's fascinated by them. There is a great, fantastic, you know, idea. Uh, but it's an idea, and the question is, how do we implement them? And implementing them, there are two parts. One is to build the chain to make sure the block's order cannot be altered and the content of the blocks cannot be altered. You know what? This maybe wasn't easy 50 years ago, but um, by now, that is easy. You take the hash of a block, you put in the next block. Everybody does that. The real argument is about who chooses the next block. That's the whole difficulty. That's the and um, let's look about you know, uh, popular uh, approaches, which actually don't work very well, in my opinion, and um, we know why. Proof of work uh, is really a tough. It's the first idea. It's a great idea. But you know, A, it's very expensive. B, is very slow, seven transactions per second. I mean, money of the world, the world is a big place. We want to transact. What are we going to do with seven transactions per second? Very little. So I don't mind expensive and fast, but expensive and slow, I really fail to understand. In particular, because also is very centralized, right? The blockchain of um, Bitcoin is controlled by three miners, and I just learned, uh, coming back from Shanghai, that two of these mining pools are actually owned by the same entity. Delegated proof of stake, uh, uh, another popular method, what does this mean? Well, simply mean, say, oh, we put these 21 good people in charge of choosing for us the next block for the next month. And don't worry, next month, different 21 people. Is this uh, decentralized? No. And if we made it, it's 50 rather than 21, would this be decentralized? No. And so, I mean, very, it's not decentralized, period. And um, it's very easy to mount a denial of service attack to all 21 of them, and nobody will produce blocks, and the blockchain grinds to a halt. That's not good. Bonded proof of stake. All right, bonded proof of stake, what does it mean? Oh, we let 20, 200, 2,000 people, as many as they want people, to put all money in the middle of the table where they cannot touch it. And whoever willingly separated him or herself for, for their money, they are in control of the next block. And their influence is proportional to the amount of money they put in the middle of the table. And if they misbehave, their money is confiscated. Wow. Okay. Does this work? Well, let me ask a, a very much simpler question. 
how much of your disposable income you can afford to put in the middle of a table, not touch, segregated, not invested in bonds, stock, or anything. And the answer is very little. So in a system like this, not only we make it legal, but we make it easy for big thieves with deep pockets to put a disproportionate amount of money in the middle of the table for the sole purpose of controlling the blockchain. But if they misbehave, their money is confiscated. So what? Very often, you know, what you can make by misbehaving in a blockchain that really is the money of the world is going to have trillions of dollars in assets. So if you make a billion dollars by misbehaving and your $10 million there are confiscated, that's the cost of doing business. All right. So here is the approach of it and our algorithm takes is a pure proof of stake. So it's a different a proof of stake, but a different type. So first of all, there are no punishment needed. Why? Because we make cheating impossible. That's a much better thing. By the way, we can always introduce punishment if we make us feel better. We chop the hands of the thieves. You know, many times has been uh, tried in human history, thieves have always been there, right? It's a much better to prevent harm than to expose to follow them. That's a fantasy. First of all, the money is always at your fingertip. Nobody needs to segregate anything, okay? So the money is where you have to be, ready to be spent or in, in some, um, um, or, or, uh, or invested on the blockchain somewhere. And all this money is counted. The money of all people, not the money of some people, and all the money of all people. And if most of the money is in honest hands, the system works, period. And by the way, never get in a money system in which you, if you believe that the majority of the money is in, in uh, dishonest hands. So put in another way, Technically speaking, we want to be truly decentralized. What does it mean that each token, every single token, has the same decision power of every other token in order to make the, um, the blockchain strong and secure? That is the ultimate distributed um, uh, platform you can have, and is really a tech only technology that allows you to, to, have, to be so distributed. So Algorand is based on effortless one-by-one -one Byzantine agreement, that should not be clear what it means. Let's effortless and one by one explain first. Here is the Genesis block. That's the only block which we don't need to agree upon because it's, uh, it's uh, in embedded in, in the description of the system. Next to it, a favor, a universal symbol of uh, lightness and effortlessness. And as this favor gently goes down, not all the blocks are generated. Okay, that's the way it works. So, well, how about soft forks with bifurcations? How about a proof of work? Guess what? In Algorand, there are no soft forks and there are no soft proof of work. What you have is the chain the way it was defined to be. Okay? Period. So, how about Byzantine agreement? What does this mean? Well, that is actually a 30 years old protocol by now and is a communication protocol such that when the majority say all of us participate, and uh, if the majority of us are honest, then uh, two properties are satisfied, agreement and consistency. Agreement means that not even if we start in our head with different values, at the end of a conversation, all honest people agree on the same value. Gee, isn't this easy? Because we say, anybody honest, no matter what your value is, agree on zero. Yes, ma'am. Okay, that takes, takes no steps at all. But the point is that if we started with the same value, say 27, we have to agree on 27, not on zero. So we should agree on a common value, but if we started with some value, we should agree not only on the same value, but on that value, right? And so um, that is a very strong notion. And let me tell you what has this to do with uh, uh, the blocks. So these values are what in our heads the next block ought to be. And so even though we think that each one of us, the next block is quite different, at the end we agree on one block, right? And uh, if somebody has proposed the same block to everybody, then we should agree on that block. Okay, because Byzantine agreement has been on for 30 years, there has been Byzantine agreement protocol for 30 years, correct? However, these protocols were very slow. I mean, maximum of 12 players. Now we want to put, put you know, a billion players. That's uh, very instant technology to be developed in order to, to handle them. And moreover, they were developed for 
players who know each other from the beginning to end. The set of players is fixed. And in a, we want instead a permissionless blockchain, and we have no idea who is going to be now and in the future. So, but make no, no sense. Algorand delivers Byzantine agreement, but on a, on a very scalable and uh, with a, a great efficiency. So, again, in summary, Algorand uh, is the main assumption is of the honesty of the majority of money, and the main technical advantage is trivial computation. Anybody can participate, just a few additions, a few comparisons, maybe one verification of a digital signature, nothing. And the two just decentralization, uh, that's what I already said, every token has the same influence with any other token, no matter whether it is uh, in your wallet or uh, invested somewhere. E all payments are final because there are no forks. So once a block appears, you can rely on the payments right away. And you have a perfect scalability because we can generate a block as fast as it can be propagated the, over the network. And by the way, faster than that, you cannot actually really get. Because to decide whether a transaction of that new block are valid, you must know the transaction of the previous block. So you must have seen this before you generate this. And then great security. Really security against a very bad adversary. How bad? Very bad. Okay, that is the guy, and what can he do? He can immediately corrupt any players, okay? No time, no, 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 no discussions, you know, get to know the person you want to attack. No, you corrupt them right away, and you perfectly control and coordinate all the players you have corrupted at no cost, perfect coordination. And you can attack both the protocol and the communication network on which the protocol is executed. And the latter is traditionally discarded. We focus on attacks on the block, like, you know, uh, mining the block and hiding it. These are gentlemen attack, right? An adversary with thangs, somebody uh, 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 is going to attack anything he can, in particular, the very communication network. He can cut wires, he can isolate countries, or can do anything he wants. The only thing he cannot do is to forge your digital signature, because if the system is secure, secure not even a national state can do that. Do we need to be so adversarial? Absolutely, yes. Because either you want to be successful or we are not successful. But if we are successful, we have trillions of dollars in our custody, okay? And with that amount of money, bad players like this, they are going to show up, rise up like mushrooms after the rain, okay? We better be prepared. Okay, let me give you a conceptual idea of how Algorand works. Algorand works in two magic phases, where magic is actually replaced by mathematics. Shh. But it's easier to talk about magic than about mathematics, right? Okay. So, phase one is the proposal phase, which means that a random user is selected among all the billions of users with probability proportional to the amount of money he or she has in the system. And what does this user do? It just proposes a new block, looks around for valid transaction on yet in the blockchain, puts a block and propagates it. Remember, we are in a pure proof of stake. So how do we select this person? Technically, what do we do is that we select a random token among all tokens, all the billions and billions of tokens out there. And then is correct, this token must belong to some public key, and this public key is, is owned by an owner. That owner proposes the block. Phase one has ended. Now phase two. A thousand users are randomly selected among the set of all users, again, proportional to the amount of money they have, and what do they do? They agree on the block proposed by the first user. Why is this necessary? Because in any society, in a blockchain is no exception, there is going to be bad actors, right? Maybe 1%, maybe 2%. If you are unfortunate enough to live in a very dangerous society, maybe 10%, maybe 20%, but they're not going to be in a majority, right? Why? Otherwise, there is no society. If the police routinely incarcerates the innocent, if the judges, uh, uh, I mean, this is a jungle, <laughs> not, a, not a society. So, if you have a system in which you take a random token, which belongs to a random user, and you put them in charge of uh, selecting a block, 
if there is going to be 10% bad actors, even a very dangerous society, one in 10 times this selected user is going to be bad. And what can he or she do? He can tell you one block and me a different block, try to put us in disagreement. So that's why instead in the second phase, we catch this possibility by running Byzantine agreement on the proposed blocks, if just in case the proposal is malicious. And why do we feel confident about that? Because if there is a 10% of bad actors, but now you select a thousand of them to be in a committee, the probability that the majority of this committee is dishonest is absolutely infinitesimally small. And therefore, we are under the conditions in which we can run Byzantine agreement. Oops. We are working for you. I don't know. Well, well, well. All right. So apparently, we lost, you know, a, a never mind. We lost, you know, some of the slides. Well, I'm Italian, I can talk with my hands, which I'm going to do right now. Okay, so, never mind this. So, you know, in a system like I, I just described, in which there is 1,000 people committee, that's where the power is, because the first people committee must agree on the block selected by, by the first uh, uh, user, right? And so, who selects this damn committee? If I tell you I do, would you trust me? I hope not. Right, because that is hyper centralized. If I tell you, all of humanity has a discussion to agree on a thousand people committee who then agrees on the block, no, because we we'll never stop discussing. I mean, uh, we all die before we agree on anything. So, in Algorand, what this committee does is something very strange. They select themselves. On the face of it, that is a terrible idea, right? Because if you select yourself, you, if I'm bad, I'm selecting myself today and then tomorrow and then the day after, right? So, so what is the, the trick? The trick is that when you select um, yourself by winning an individual lottery, which is cryptographically fair, that you run in the privacy of your computer. And if you win, you have a winning ticket and you can propagate it to the network thereby saying, listen to my opinion, I've been selected to approve this block, and here is my winning ticket, and here is my approval or disapproval of the block. Okay? So why is this fast? Because in a microsecond, I see if I'm selected within the committee, and everybody sees if he's selected. And those 1,000 of us who actually have a winning ticket, they propagate it together with their opinion of the block. One microsecond, that's fast. Okay, why is this secure? Because if I'm the big scary guy that can corrupt anybody I want instantaneously, whom do I want to corrupt? I want to corrupt the committee. But I have a problem. I do not know who is in the committee. Because who is in the committee depends on a private lottery that each one of us is running by themselves. So I don't know whom to corrupt. However, after you figure out that you are in the committee and you propagate your winning ticket and your opinion about the block, now I know who you are, I can corrupt you right away. However, whatever you had to say, I cannot stop it because it's virally propagated over the network. So in some sense, I cannot corrupt you beforehand because I don't know who you are. An ex post doesn't matter if I corrupt you or not because whatever you said is already been virally propagated around the network, right? That essentially is, um, is um, uh, the idea. And by the way, so these are for some people, when they start doing, uh, playing with a uh, Byzantine uh, agreement protocol, and the protocol is such that, you know, uh, different steps are performed by different pay players in different numbers because uh, they are selected by lottery. And, uh, but the, the protocol works as all these uh, uh, committee members are one committee from beginning to end. So in other words, in the Algorand protocol, the agreement is super fast, but it's also run by separate people, one 
one different committee per, per step. Why? Because if you have anybody in power, even for two minutes, can be the target of a denial of service attack. But if each step is segregated to a separate committee, after you attack that committee, you're not going to stop the second committee for the second step because it's totally different people. So that is what it means to be truly distributed. And now I'd like to share with you what happens in Algorand 2.0. And uh, what happens in Algorand 2.0 is that you, know, you have a better yet agreement. If you remember what I said conceptually, what happens is that first somebody proposes a block, that's one phase. Second phase, we agree on the block proposed. Here we fuse the two phases. So we agree on the block while the block is propagating on the network. And therefore, we lose no time. That's why it is really super fast. So the way it works is like this. There is a random proposer for each block. Each proposer is replaced super fast. And when the proposer is honest, you are going to have always a new and finalized block. Finalized means that this cannot be changed whatsoever. So every block in Algorand is finalized. You know that in some proposal, people plan to finalize one in a hundred of the blocks. We finalize them all, one by one. And what happens if a malicious proposer is in charge of, of a block? Well, if he successfully pro, um, uh, behaves so that there is a new block, that block is finalized too and there is never going to be a fork. Let me tell you that uh, I said that the attack into the network is something that you should worry about. When an, an adversary attacks the network, say divides into two or one fourth and, uh, and three quarters, he can pocket all the messages that try to go across. So somehow an adversary could capture enough votes of the committee on one block and keep it in his pocket and then reveal it later to create a fork. And that is a problem that uh, we want to avoid. But this is not going to be a problem because actually a problem is solved because Algorand 2.0 not only is super fast, but is actually resilient to network partitions. Because the following thing happens. If the adversary has enough votes in his pocket to secretly finalize a block, then that block will be immediately and publicly finalized. So he cannot keep hold of his, his certificate of a new finalized block and reveal it whenever he, he wants. And by the way, that is very important property because partition of the network, which we have not yet seen, we are going to see them because anything that is bad and lucrative will happen. And, and so any system that finalizes a block, say in one minute or an hour a, or a day, is vulnerable to partition the last a bit more than a minute, a bit more than an hour, and a bit more than a day. And because we don't want to slow systems, which finalize things in a day, we want things that finalize things in a minute, partitioning the network in a minute is not going to be that improbable. So in particular, proof of work is totally destroyed if under these types of attacks. So let me tell you how a potential execution happens of Algorand 2.0. So let's assume we are at the beginning, and there is an honest uh, user proposing the block. Then what is going to happen is going to have a, a certificate for finalizing a first block, and then immediately a an, an next user is going to propose the next block. Let's assume that this user is bad. Well, if the user is bad, he can force you not to generate any block whatsoever. But he's forced because he's replaced very quickly, somebody else will succeed him. Let's see who. Damn, another bad guy. Okay, then he also doesn't want any certificate. Okay, but finally, because right, there is an honest majority of the system, you're going to get, uh, in fact, pretty quickly, an honest guy. And when this happens, you have a new finalized block and next person to propose. Also a bad guy. This bad guy has a different idea. I want to have a hidden certificate. I'm not going to say no block now, but I'm going to have a certificate in my, that nobody has seen for a finalized block. And that's what something happens. If you follow whatever I said is that no matter who is in charge, bad or 
or, or honest that follows that whenever a, a hidden certificate exists, that certificate that was hidden is forced to become common knowledge and is finalized to next guy. That's how it works. So an ad adversary, he can slow you down whenever it's turn not to get a block, but he can never misuse a hidden block that he's able to create. And so much so that now this bad guy says, okay, now is my turn, what, what can I do? I see that you know, whether I hide the block you know, is finalized in any way, you know what? I certify a new block anyway, at least it contains only my friends and family, it's better than nothing, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how the system generates, right? Okay, I'd like to, to tell you that, you know, um, I believe that uh, contributing from uh, day one to have, you know, a, a block generation that is immune to network attacks is very important because we really take security very, very important. But the algorithms are actually a very deep roadmap, and I'd like to share um, some of them with you. The first one is secure incentives. We've heard about in the debate that you know, incentives can be tricky. Of course they're tricky, because when you try to engineer incentives, you are trying to engineer human beings, and we must admit we are very complicated. So I'm not surprised that most incentive schemes do not work. Because when you want to throw money at somebody, here is the money scheme to get a reward, please do whatever I want. Thank you for your money, I don't care what you want, okay? I want to maximize my money. So what a secure incentive, so if you look at miners, miners is not something that, like the rain, you know, there is nature, it rains sometimes. Miners is not rain. Miners is the subproduct of an incentive scheme that Mr. or Mrs. Nakamoto failed to design properly. And, and they generated this tremendous concentration. So what do I mean by secure incentives? Are an incentive scheme that prevents centralization of power. And that's what we want. Because if you don't have secure incentive, you are better off without incentives. In fact, for a long time, I thought about the designing algorithm because the cost of participation is so low without giving money to anybody until we found a secure incentive scheme. Now we feel much better if we provide incentives in a secure way and uh, for keeping the blockchain work. Another thing that you know, we are going to have, you know, Dutch auction on chain, that's the way actually we plan to launch our currency. Why? Because I think that you know, a cryptocurrency is going to require the trust of everybody. If you want to be the money of the world, we better trust each other, okay? And um, whenever I offer in the typical ICO, right, to say, okay, anybody can buy, here is a very simple auction, uh, fixed price, one token, $2. So you can ask me, is $2 a fair price? What do you mean fair price? That is the price. If you don't want to buy it, don't. So there is nothing fair about it. And by the way, we all know that if there is an ICO, there has been a pre-ICO. And in the pre-ICO, I offered one token at 20 cents to a few chosen people, friends and family, and what's fair about that? Even less. So what we plan to do is that we use Dutch auction on chain so that we are very transparent, everybody sees the bids, and so what is the price? The price is what you decide, not me. So the market ought to decide the price. That's the only way in which you are going to have confidence in the fairness of the process. By the way, I can continue to discuss something on the left, but I want to be mindful of time. So we are going to have smart contracts, but the smart contracts are going to be not quite the ones you are used to. We are going to be as innovative in the smart contract platform on Algorand than as we have been on the consensus protocol. And we are going to have an, um, treasury bonds of our virtual treasury because how can you have a, a, a currency without bonds? So we must be able to tell each other, not in blog post, I trust Algorand. I think Algorand is great, right? I mean, well, if you think it's so great, what would you be able to buy a bonds of a thousand algo and then receive a hundred more algo a year for now, say an interest rate of 
we need to be able to express our confidence in the um, health, the economic health of, uh, of the system. Because if you do, you, if you put your money where your, your, your mouth is, then we know that you really believe in the strength of Algorand. So, and if you buy, um, um, if you think Algorand is going down, would you accept uh, getting a, uh, buying, uh, uh, blocking your tokens for one year and then get an extra 100 tokens later? No, you're going to sell, sell, sell at the exchange as fast as you can. So if you, if you see people do that, or if you see people that actually accept 5% bonds, that's a way in which we can tell each other how strong our system is, and we need these signals. So, so far, cryptocurrencies have been some crypto, but no currency. So we need these type of uh, things to, to, to run on the system. And the other thing that I wanted to have is um, secure self-governance. We already heard in the debate, we need it. We heard about incentives, we heard about mechanism design, the incentives are very hard. We need also self-governance. Why? Because nothing human is perfect to begin with. Right? We are all imperfect, but we have the ability to change. Life is about intelligent adaptation. And I find nothing at all intelligent about having a fixed set of rules which cannot be changed or can be changed by hard fork. How can you do an hard fork? How many times can you afford an hard fork? How many times can you split the community? How many times can you split the currency? So, but right now, cryptocurrencies are ocean liners on autopilot. Where is the captain? Oops, he's overboard. Where is the rudder? We don't have any rudder. So, how can, how can this happen? So the only thing we want to do, we must have a technical mechanism to allow us to vote on chain without collusion and everything else, to decide if we want to approve a new rule, if we want to approve a new monetary policy. Because if we adapt, we leave. And if we become dinosaurs, we are going to die very quickly because now <laughs> the waiver is not uh, too good for dinosaurs. All right. So um, that is why I think the last line, right, enabling continuous progress is really what I think the, the most important aspect of any cryptocurrency. Okay, because, you know, we need to always to make progress, progress, progress. So that's what uh, um, uh, being human is about. And uh, if we don't have it in our, uh, and, 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 uh, and a blockchain is a community of, uh, of people. So we need to have this intelligent evolvability of a protocol from day one. So, as I try to keep uh, time, let me tell you what my opinion is. I think that you know, blockchain is a great adventure, right? And we should all be congratulated to believe in them and even more to those who actually had the guts to architect and launch, which is not easy, new, new uh, project. I actually believe that we are going to see multiple winners. That is not, you know, a winner takes it all. And uh, multiple approaches will continue to be useful. However, only via true technology will realize our full aspiration about blockchain. Blockchain is not gold, which is a bunch of atoms that no matter what we do, we stay the same. They need to wear <laughs> about the technology. So I really believe that the right technology will set us free to cooperate and interact with each other, unmediated by everybody, direct with each other. And uh, therefore, I'm afraid that we'll need more technology, QED. Thank you.